Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program at Mechanics Institute Online for Blizzard Poems with Henri Cole and D.A. Powell. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at Mechanics Institute, and we're very pleased to co-sponsor this event with City Lights, Books and Publishing, and we thank our friend and longtime collaborator, Peter Maravellis, Events Director at City Lights, who's with us tonight. Hello, Peter, and welcome. So for those of you who are <laughs> new, uh, Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. It features a general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author events, and our Cinema Lit film series. So please check out the website for all of our online programs. All right, we're very pleased to welcome back Henri Cole for his new book, Blizzard, which is a beautiful collection of daring, tender, truthful poems that build on his reputation for his quiet mastery and modern austerity of Kavafi and Bishop. Cole's lucid, empathetic poems speak to the heart. Its lightness, its darkness, with a lyrical beauty and also ethical depth and provides us with poems that both transform and heal us in this time of anxiety and time of unrest. So I'd like to now introduce our two guests, two poets of great acclaim. Um, Henri Cole was born in Japan, and he's published over a dozen previous collections of poetry, including Touch and Pierce the Skin, a memoir, and also his wonderful book, Orphic Paris, which we love. Uh, that one received many awards, including, um, he's also received many awards for all of his work, including the Jackson Poetry Prize, the Kingston Tufts Award, the Rome Prize, the Berlin Prize, and the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize, as well as the award of Merit Medal in Poetry from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And he is a teacher at the Claremont McKenna College. And our other guest will be our interviewer, uh, D.A. Powell, a longtime member at Mechanics Institute, is the author of five collections of poetry, including Useless Landscape, or a Guide for Boys, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award in Poetry. And his honors include the Kingsley Tufts Prize in Poetry, the Shelley Memorial Prize, and an Arts and Letters Award in Literature from the Academy of Arts and Letters, as well as fellowships, fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. So please welcome Henri Cole and D.A. Powell. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, and thank you, Henri, for asking me to join you for this event when we were planning it. Um, it was all going to be you coming to the city and us being at the Mechanics Institute and, you know, having this virtually is literally the next best thing. Um, Thank you for doing this, Doug. I, I, I just wanted to, to say, you know, how much um, the Mechanics Institute uh, means to the literary community in San Francisco. Not only are they a library and a chess room and um, they sponsor all of these amazing events, but the building itself houses the offices for Litquake and for um, Ziziva Magazine. So um, it really is sort of the literary heart of the city. Um, Henri, you did an event uh, for Mechanics Institute previously. So this is your second time around. Yes, when Orphic Paris came out, um, I guess about two years ago, uh, the first event was in San Francisco at the, at the Institute. I wonder if we're having technical difficulties already. I just have a white screen, like a Zoom screen. Uh, is someone fixing that? Can everybody? Is someone sharing their screen? Something seems to be amiss. It's Richard Syme, C 
seen. Richard? <laughs> What's going on? Something is amiss. Um, if you're sharing your screen, could you unshare your screen, please? Yes, somebody, Richard, it says Richard S-I-M-E-S -S, is sharing his back. screen. Yeah, and now we, can, we can go set. back into uh, our regular view. Okay, great. We can, you can also, everyone, you can go on speaker view or gallery view. Okay, we're back. Thank Richard. you. Okay. Richard well, is my student. Know. He's a wonderful poet. <laughs> It, it, it wouldn't be a virtual event if we didn't have some sort of technical <laughs> snafu. Better to have it right in the beginning, and then we can yes. just move right past. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about that book, um, Orphic Paris, because um, I remember when you were um, writing these pieces and publishing them, and it was a, like a series of, of um, a series of love poems to the city of Paris. Um, what started you on that, and when did you begin to conceive of it as a book? Well, what really started me was that I had uh, an editor who wanted me to write. Uh, she was then an editor at the uh, New Yorkers. Uh, lit they had a literary blog, The Page Turner, which is still quite lively. and. Um, I don't know, I felt that blog writing was largely either, I don't know, like current events or gossip, and I didn't really want to do either of those. So I asked her if I could do these little, I actually thought of them as hyphoons as I began to write them because they were, uh, the hyphoon form is a Japanese form that goes from prose down to this lyric, uh, well, to this uh, haiku. And so I, by combining prose with photographs, I was trying to replicate the typhoon form. And I don't know, I wrote one for her and then another and a couple years went by and I, I had 16 or 17 of them and I realized I had a book. Um, uh, my mother had died and my mother was a French woman. And um, I started going to France three or four times a year after her death probably just to be around the French language. And uh, that's really, that's really what, you know, how, how that was the genesis of the book. Yeah. Um, and I, I noticed that you, you have elegies in the book. There's that beautiful uh, piece that you wrote about James Lord. Um, yes, yes. And so it's a, it's a hybrid book. It combines autobiography with kind of portraits of, there are two sort of main figures in it. One is my French translator, who is now 95, um, and her name is Claire Malroux, uh, an excellent poet herself. A book of hers is, her selected poems is about to come out from the New York Review of Books, um, with, translated by Marilyn Hacker. And um, so there's that dimension. And then there's the little story of my mother's family. My mother was from Marseille. And then there's the story of my sort of, I don't know, my sort of days in Paris and a few friendships that I had there. Um, I, I, love, I love following you around the city and following your mind and um, sense of inquiry. Thank you. There's one poem in the book. There's one poem in Blizzard, which is my one Paris poem, which is Paris is my Saraquel. Um, uh, my mother took Saraquel, which was a, is a, a anti-psychotic, actually. And um, so that's where that, that title came from. Um, when, when, when we get to the reading portion, will you read that poem? With pleasure, Doug. Absolutely. Good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I love following you around the graveyards in Montparnasse and visiting Susan Sontag's grave and just that sense of, um, that sense of a flaneur, that sense of someone who um, spends their days 
going from museum to cafe to graveyard to um, hotel and um, all of the sensory pleasure that you evoke in those essays is just marvelous. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Um, it was a fun book to write. It was a fun, I'm trying to do another version of that now, but I started, well, I guess we've been in confinement about six months now and I, I didn't do anything really, but clean drawers for three months. But, um, but then I finally got to work and I started, I started writing as prose in a similar style, but about some poets that I, that I knew and didn't know. So um, I don't quite know what I'm doing, but I'm having fun, fun. I, I, I trust implicitly an artist who admits that they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I, I think when we know what we're doing, we're in danger. Yes. I, I um, think writing for me in large part is um, discovering subject matter. You know, the writing process itself leads me to, uh, leads me to content. Um, and Place is very important to you, um, yes. to move not just from Paris, but um, to other places. Um, Boston has been your home now for how long? Often. Uh, I am speaking in my kitchen in Boston, and I moved into this apartment 26 years ago. I can hardly believe it. Uh, this apartment, we used to be sort of a borderline neighborhood, but now it's all completely, you know, gentrified. But I moved here, I taught, I was teaching at Harvard then, I taught there six years, and uh, uh, retrospectively, I'm so glad I didn't get a home in Cambridge. Uh, I really had loved being here in the South End. Um, And um, is, do you find that you write more there, or do you write more when you're in transit? Like, wh where where do where does the inspiration hit? Doug, for the last years, all of my writing has been in France. Um, mostly at home here, I just take care of life. Um, and in California, mostly I just am a teacher. And so when I escaped to France is really when I've done most of my writing in the last years, um, almost everything. Um, it, uh, there's something about uh, the time difference and everyone being asleep behind me and um, um, the language, a different language swirling around me. I just, it frees me up and uh, I feel the most, sort of safe and consoled there. So I, I don't know, that's where I do my most lately. Though, as I say, I did start this prose project here and I tried to replicate, you know, in, in France, I sit on a sofa. <laughs> I sit on a sofa when I write, you know, I don't sit at a desk. So I, 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 uh, I had to sort of recreate the sofa <laughs> situation. I think where you sit is very important, you know. Um, <laughs> Since the since we've been teaching remotely, I'm teaching from home. You'll notice the very glamorous backdrop here of yes. my light switch. <laughs> but this is the place where I can get the best internet service. So this is where I teach from and where I do Zoom events from. And then when I just want to write or paint, I have my desk in the front of the apartment. So I'm constantly nice. having to take this with me and yes. um, you have I, to know how long your battery will stay with you but you know you you, you have to get in the right chair the chair where the poems happen <laughs> I like the kitchen for some reason the kitchen is the least cluttered room um, in my house I because I've lived here so long the rooms are filling up but the kitchen I keep simple and I like sitting here in the morning and and at least thinking about writing poems, <laughs> so. Was the kitchen important to you as a child? Yes, it was. I think that might be a French thing, you know, because in France, the dining room table is sort of in the middle of the living room. <laughs> you know, so everybody is sitting around the table 
for these long meals. So that might have something to do with it, though. Though I, I sit alone at my table here, um, but still, I, I just love sitting in here. I think the kitchen is usually the brightest room in any place that I've ever lived. Um, so being able to go there for the light and for the, it, it's a good place to read. It's a good place to pull together your thoughts in the morning, have tea. Um, Isn't this strange? Isn't this strange what we're doing? <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you objectify it at all, it is so bizarre what we're doing right now. It's, it it amuses know. me. But yeah, I have to remind myself that there are 50 people in this conversation. Too, you know? And to remember that all of these people have, for the moment, been invited into your kitchen and my kitchen. Yes. And we get to see into their libraries and offices and kitchens and bedrooms and yes i haven't i have maybe i'll adjust to see a few faces i spotted one of your former colleagues and one of mine kyoko mori with her cats i love kyoko i've known kyoko since i was 22. um, um did you go to school together Yes, we went to Wisconsin together, um, and we we started out together. I I love her. I don't know where she is, but uh, um, well, hopefully she's um, hopefully she's uh, still in in D.C. The last I saw her, um, we'll have to find out after the reading. Um, I want to talk about this new book, um, Blizzard. First of all, the title, your, um, your editor had um, some trepidation about it. Um, well, there was a lot of discussion about the title, uh, but I always wanted a one word title. And I was thinking, I wasn't really thinking of a weather event. I was thinking of a deluge of emotion. That was really what I felt the book was or represented. So, um, oh, I should say too that the cover image uh, was done by Charlie Gross, um, who was a neurologist who died about 18 months ago now. And um, he, I hope he would have been happy to see his picture on the cover. Um, I'm very pleased with the way it looks. It's beautiful. Um, how long did it take you to compile this book? Did it go? It's about five years. Yeah. It's been about five years. I'm not really a, a, a book project person. I write one poem at a time and I finish a poem and then I write another one. Um, sometimes uh, sometimes they come to me and, you know, and, you know, two or three at a time, but um, um, I suppose it'll be five years before I have another. <laughs> so. Well, depending. I mean, I feel like one of the things that, that strikes me about this collection is how timely it is in relation to political events uh, climate science, um, the state of the world. Do you feel like um, that's one of the energies that shakes you loose and, and makes you want to sit down and say something? Well, yes, I feel certainly that's one of the functions of the lyric. Um, I think of myself as a lyric poet, which, which means that most often I'm presenting myself in a, a moment of being and feeling. Um, but I think it's important that the camera not always be inward, that it be outward as well. Yeah. And um, the whole middle section of this book is has the more public poems in it. Um, 
Um, so yes, I think that's one of the one of the functions of the poet. And I don't know. I feel often when I'm pushing against something, that's the energy that brings a poem. Um, um, you know, it can be unhappiness, it can be anger, it can be joy, it can be affection, but it can also be, uh, pow you know, power, uh, writing against power. I think that's... Trying to redistribute power when it seems out of balance. If possible. If possible. Yeah. Um, will, you, uh, will you read some poems um, and... Um, uh, then we'll have time for questions afterward. But um, I just feel okay. like. Uh, why don't I, I, really why don't I read a few? Yes. Why don't I read a few of the public ones? Or, or maybe that's the wrong word, public. Um, I don't know what the right word is, civic. <laughs> or, I guess political, you could say political. I, I always feel a little shy of claiming that word for myself because I feel others are are so much stronger in that regard. Um, well, writing is political. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, this poem, maybe I'll read this poem called Gross National Unhappiness, um, which has a silly title, but it's a serious poem. <clears throat> No, I am not afraid of you descending the long white marble steps from a White Hawk helicopter to a state-sponsored spectacle of mansplaining and lies. If you divide the sea, you will wind up in a ditch. The she-goat will mount the he-goat. Good deeds will cut out our tongues. No tree will penetrate a radiant sky. Can't you see our tents cannot be separated? Can't you see your 1,000 dogs are not greater than our 1,000 gazelles? Maybe I'll read this one called haiku, which is uh, which isn't a haiku. It's more of a haipun, I suppose. It's like a sonnet that turns into a a, a sonnet that turns into a haipun, maybe or a haiku. I, I don't know. Haiku. After the sewage flowed into the sea and took the oxygen away. The fishes fled, but the jellies didn't mind. They stayed and ate up the food the fishes left behind. I sat on the beach in my red pajamas and listened to the sparkling foam, like feelings being fustigated. Nearby, a crayfish tugged on a string. In the distance, a man waved. Unnatural cycles seemed to be establishing themselves without regard to our lives. Deep inside, I could feel a needle skip. Autumn dark, murmur of the saw, poor humans. Let's see, maybe I'll read one more from this, depart, this part of the book called Doves. Doves. Um, the first, this, well, I'll just read this poem. I, I was going to try and say that I, I want to, I guess I want to say that I think the book has a lot of pleasure in it and joy, and that there isn't just a preoccupation with this elegiac 
voice, uh, that that's important to me that um, the book include that. Um, this, however, isn't one of those poems, but I'll read it nonetheless. Because of it has, it has a slight, it has a, a voice of resistance in it. Um, though the title is called Doves. Gray and white, as if with age, or some preserving of the past, as in Beowulf, our hoary ancestor, hoary as in a bat or a willow, or the venerable hoary dove that flew straight into my picture window today and then lay dead on the front porch. We buried it in some distorted version of its normal self, folded in a white cloth napkin in the backyard, still soft enough to be cut into like a cabbage, I thought, I'm glad I'm not dead. Listen to them now, higher up in the trees, biting and scratching with their unmistakable twitch of life. Don't fear nothing their twittering voices cry. The true spirit of living isn't eating greedily or reflection or even love, but dissidence like an ax of stone. Should, I, <laughs> should we? Talk a little more. Oh, on I, I I want you to read as many poems as we can squeeze in. Okay, I'll read a I'll read a, I'll, re, I'll read another one from this department. I'll read this uh, or not department from this um, section of the book uh, will be consistent. I'll read these two sort of Armenian poems, which I think of as Armenian poems. My mother was born in Marseille, but her ancestors were Armenian. Um, her, her parents were immigrants. And, uh, and this poem really, uh, this poem called Weeping Cherry, really tells the story of her people who arrived in, in, in Marseille with the, with the help of, um, well, really a ship captain that brought them from uh, Asia Minor um, during, a, you know, during a time of, of great violence. Um, so it's called Weeping Cherry. On a plateau with little volcanic mountains, a muddy river dangerous when the snow melts, a fertile valley, cattle breeders and a music academy, a tall, handsome, agile people with straight black hair and an enterprising spirit lived peaceably. Though there had never been hatred between the races, after a quarrel over local matters, Massacres came, men, women, and children robbed and deported. An evacuation, they called it. Heads impaled on branches, mounds of corpses, like grim flowers knotted together. A passing ship transported a few to a distant port where mother was born, though now she too has vanished into the universe and the cold browns the weeping cherry, vivid red mixed with blue. So beautiful. Thank you, um, Doug. Thank you. And, and the poem thereafter, is that the, the other one that you're gonna read? Yes, I read this one at the cathedral in San Francisco with with uh, with you and the people in the little box right next to you on my screen, <laughs> Bob and Brenda. <laughs> I see, I see them. Um, 
So, uh, uh, but do you mind if I read it again? <laughs> I would love to hear it. The genesis of this poem, uh, really, a friend of mine works in an archive, art archive, and she sent me a photograph of Armenians, um, starving Armenians eating a horse. And at the same time that my friend sent me that picture, uh, you know, every day on the TV news, there were pictures of uh, migrants, you know, uh, crossing borders and uh, starved looking. And that was really the genesis of this, this poem. Two things conflated in my mind. Migrants devouring the flesh of a dead horse. Since there's no time for grinding or cooking, it's best not to drag the parts too far as the solitary knife goes in and out. The mama is exhausted, but also rather mild in her expression. And the baby resembles a seahorse compelled to know something painful. No one appears left out, stabbing, licking, or chewing, or sees the texture of the animal's insides mirrored in the fluttering of cloth, not lightness or delicacy, but something more basic related to the moist earth. Once this horse ornamented a field with its flexible limbs and nuzzling head, eat me, it neighs now. The tree of life is greater than all the helicopters of death. The tree of life is more powerful than all the helicopters of death. <laughs> yes, that was, that was a hard line. The endings are the hardest part of my poems. You know, I sort of write towards an ending. I don't know what it is. Um, It comes long after sometimes. <clears throat> well, endings I think are hard in general. <laughs> yes, yeah. I like the, I'm drawn to aphorisms and um, I suppose that's what I'm trying to do there is um, be aphoristic. Do you ever just um, come up with lines that you feel are endings and you put them all in a file together? Um, that happens more with titles in the beginnings than the ending. Um, because as I say, really the writing leads me to, leads me to a surprise usually. Um, um, I'm trying to think, uh, the last thing I changed in the book was an ending. Uh, the last thing the last thing I changed is this poem called Rice Pudding. Uh, the very last thing I changed was the last line of that poem. But that happened sort of because of, I think because of life, you know, something happened in life that had to be in the poem rather than the ending that was there before. Um, but. Well, I love the ending of this poem, so now you're going to have to read it for all the people who don't have it in front of them. Okay. Okay. I won't say what the old ending was, <laughs> because I want this one to be better. Um, it's called Rice Pudding, and I have to say I love rice pudding. Um, I really do. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. In fact, I've said to myself many times in confinement that I was going to cook myself rice pudding, and I haven't done that. Um, not yet. Uh, let's see. This I think what occasioned this poem to begin with was I went to see an opera with my friend Claire, who was 95, as I mentioned. She was probably about 91 or two then. And we went to see Hansel and Gretel in Paris together, and that was really the genesis of this uh, the beginning of the setting. Um, 
rice pudding. Hansel and Gretel were picking strawberries and listening to a bronze cuckoo. As the forest mist thickened, Hansel snuggled up to his little sister, admitting they were lost. They were the children of a broom maker who drank too much. They did not understand that a wife is to a husband what the husband makes her, or that even in our misery life goes on. Squirrels play, bees forage, hemlocks bow. Sitting at the kitchen table, I eat yesterday's meat peas and carrots with a bowl of rice pudding. Now that you are dead, my stubborn heart lives. I've never read that at a kitchen table. <laughs> so, yeah, it feels like the perfect setting, doesn't it? That was unexpected. That was an unprogrammed. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, that's uh, uh, not at all where I uh, thought the poem was going when it opened. And I think that that's one of the pleasures of reading your work is oh, the, thank you. the surprise of... Um, I, think, I think that's something that the sort of free verse sonnet form encourages is this kind of um, um, divigating um you know i think that's to me is what keeps the sonnet interesting to me is that i mean there of course there's the idea of the seed of change within it so i want i do want something to happen i don't want it to just be description um that would be a much easier poem to write and probably pleasurable but i want to be led to some fresh idea um, if I can put it that way. And I want there to be some fractures uh, and leaps along the way, even though it's just 14 lines. Um, that's important to me. The nonlinearity is important to me. I feel that. I feel that in your work. Um, it's, it's not simply... Uh, serving up a story, um, but um, finding the underlying uh, meanings and motivations behind what it is that people do. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I think, you know, I love describing. It's such a pleasurable thing to describe. Um, well, it's sort of like eating rice pudding in a way, but that's not, that, you know, that's not enough for a poem for me. I mean, I want the poem to do something else. Um, um, I have a, a personal favorite in this collection. You do? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the poem on page 49, uh, which is written um, at that point in the, uh, the AIDS pandemic. I mean, speaking of pandemics, uh, no better time than now to revisit the pandemics that we're already in. Um, Page 49, I see. Epivir, D4T, and Crixivan. Um, yes, the title is sort of three first-generation HIV drugs. It's a cocktail. Um, I'm sorry? It's a cocktail. And, uh, it's a cocktail. There you go. Um, I was just going to say, oh, I have chronic here on my stove. <laughs> but... Not cocktail, <laughs> but um, um, shall I read this one? Yeah, and if you want to say anything about the genesis of it, that would be great too. I'm always well. There are these three poems in the book. Keep me, the one that comes before it, and they're that are they look back. I lived in New York in the '80s. I moved there in 1980. Um, I was a graduate student at Columbia, and I stayed there a dozen years, and they were such, uh, you know, such, um, oh, they were such dark years, really, in many ways. Um, 
but and so I don't know what what it was in the last the last years that has I've been thinking a lot about that time and I wanted to write about it. It's funny I didn't write at all about it at the time. Um, I think I was probably too frightened. Um, there's nothing much more to say about this poem. Um, it actually conflates several things um, for one person. Uh, Epivir, D4T, and Crixivan. The new disease came, but not without warning. The drugs were a toxic combo that kept the sick going another year. I loved how you talked in your sleep about free will. Your clothes smelled, but the blood levels were normal. Now I have seen the sun god. This is what I thought when I first saw you. The face, the bearing, but perfection of form meant nothing to you. And we were all just souls carrying around a corpse. I smoked cannabis while the government slept. Drug companies held parties in Arizona and Florida. The profit motive always thrives. To those who didn't sell well in the bars, it felt like revenge of the nerds. Goaded by your hand, I wrote poems, an essence squeezed out of this matter, memory now. I, I think that uh, first line, the new disease came, but not without warning. Um, is so timely given what we're experiencing right now. I mean, the whole reason that we're doing this virtually is because there's another pandemic that we- It's see. extraordinary, isn't it? You know, Doug, nobody was rushing for a vaccine, you know. They're still not. Yeah. There's, you know, um, the drug also, companies are getting fat off of the um, expensive therapy that will keep you going in, interminably. Yes, that's I, I was the other thing I was going to say was that people didn't die in six weeks. They, you know, they lived, they lived, you know, they suffered for a lot longer. Um, a cautionary tale. Yes, yeah. Um, we have questions from the audience, and I think, um, Pam, are you curating that part of it? Yes, I, I'll be um, reading questions from the uh, from the chat. Okay, so Whenever, if, are you ready now? Would you like to take some? Um, yes, you I can say the name if you want. Oh, I definitely, I will, I will give the name, <clears throat> excuse okay. me. We'll, we'll give people a chance to ask questions and Henri maybe read one more poem while people are formulating their questions. Of course, um, one more poem, we'll just see which one should, I, maybe I'll read what, a poem of pleasure. Um, yeah. A poem of pleasure. Uh, I'll read that poem about the, uh, the jam, Lingonberry Jam. Um, I was just looking to see if this person that sent me this jam is on here, but I, I don't see, I don't see her name, but, um, Lingonberry Jam. What a wondrous thing to suddenly be alive eating Natalie's Lingonberry Jam from Alaska where she picked the fruit herself with one seeing eye. In this tumultuous world we're living in with the one hour news loop, my thoughts linger more and more on the darkish side as I sit at the table with Mr. and Mrs. Sport, who still ask me, are you married yet? 
but Natalie's Lingenberry jam pierces right through into some deep, <clears throat> essential place where I am my own master and no sodomy laws exist. And where, like a snowflake or a bee lost amid the posies, I feel autonomous, blissed out, and real. <laughs> Should I look in the chat or someone else? Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm hey, going to I'm going to be reading them from out loud from the chat. Okay. okay. Thank you. So um, hold on, let me set up my video. I'm Pam Troy. I'm the events assistant. Uh, one of the first questions is from Jennifer Groats. Oh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Uh -huh. um, maybe maybe regarding the open ending lines. Henri, I'd love to hear you talk about your relationship to the sonnet, which feels so crucial and ever present. And or if you find had any observations to share about how you structured this wonderful new book. Thank you for the question. Um, when I, I am about to turn 65, I can hardly believe it. Um, but when I was 45, um, I went to live in Japan again, and um, while well, I was born there, as was mentioned, uh, I lived maybe there 18 months, and my little brother was born in Germany after me two years later. Uh, but when I was 45, I went to live in Japan, and, you know, I was reading a lot of, uh, well, I was reading a lot of Japanese novels. I was reading Kawabata a lot of Kawabata and Oe, um, and I was trying to think of what kind of poem I would write, and I just didn't feel I could, uh, you know, write haikus and tankas. So I, I thought, what is the, what is the form that my language has the the shortest lyric form that my language has a tradition in, and what if I brought to it, tried to bring to it some of the some of the qualities that I admired most in Japanese literature. And that's really how the, I started writing Sonnet. I wanted to make the speech, the language, plainer. And I wanted there to be lots of uh, simile uh, rather than um, direct statements of feeling, uh, letting the image speak for feeling. And that's really was the genesis. and. Um, it seems to me that uh, I, in a sonnet, you have just enough room to take a real deep breath and then exhale. And, um, uh, and that's about what I'm happy doing in a, in a lyric poem. Um, is that a good enough answer? I don't know. Do I have to say more? The, uh, that's enough, yeah. Okay, well, but one of the first questions was from someone named Tolawani Roberts. And yes. the question is, will you talk about your thoughts and feeling process of choosing the quotes that open parts one, two, and three? Yes, Tolawani is a very good student of mine in Claremont McKenna. Thank you for that question. Um, um, there was a lot of discussion as to whether or not the book needed these quotes um, from Merrill Heaney and from uh, a Supreme Court case. Um, and I guess I decided in the end that I thought that it, in a way it directs the readings, um, uh, that the poems were various enough you know, since it wasn't a project book, I wanted people to have some idea of the spirit behind them. And Merrill and Heaney were poets I loved most in my, you know, in my 20s and 30s. Uh, um, so th that was sort of, I wanted them to be sort of presiding spirits, I guess. Um, I have to say, Toluani. I wanted 
I feel that I very much stand on the shoulders of the, well, neither men were my teachers, but both were mentors of a sort. Um, one couldn't be more different from the other, but. That's when I tell them about the smart mouth. Being bad breath means neutralizing the real source of Someone has unmuted me. Yes, yeah, somebody, uh, somebody needs to mute themselves. We're getting some ambient noise. Um, the next question I'm going to ask you is from Carla Serrett. And you may have already answered it. Love to hear which of the older poets you feel most affinity with. Could you repeat the beginning part of your question? Um, it's from Carla Serrett. Yes. And I it's, it's love to hear, and again, you may have already, you may have just answered this, but it's oh. love to hear which of the older poets you feel the most affinity with. Well, um, when I was first starting out, I read a lot of gay poets. Um, uh, I really, really love Tom Gunn. Um, he seemed to me like in the middle ground between like Ginsburg and Merrill. He could be formal and he could be totally Dionysian. And I loved his work. Um, and uh, that's kind of a model to me is to find a place somewhere between these the most Apollonian and the most Dionysian, uh, that's where I'd like to be. So probably the poets that I liked, like Bishop, um, Elizabeth Bishop, are in that range. Um, I think maybe that's, that. Um, I loved Rich, Audrey and Rich when I was very young. Um, um, I loved Plath, Sylvia Plath, you know, I, I, uh, I loved poems with raw feeling in them. Um, even if it's really suppressed, I, I was drawn to that. Um, okay, well, the next question is from Connor Bracken. I love hearing you speak about the free verse sonnet and its fractures and allurements. I'm curious if you have a similar relationship with the guy Un, or does it offer different possibilities, pleasures in your experience? Actually, or hi Brun, I may have mispronounced that. But. I'm not even sure how, to, how do we say that? Is it hi Brun or hey Brun or how do you pronounce it? Oh, Doug, you do know? I hear it always says hi Brun. Hypoon, yeah, that's how I've said it, but I have a feeling I'm saying it wrong. Um, I don't know. Um, well, I don't, uh, I think if you're a poet, it's sort of an ideal form because it allows you, um, well, I like the idea of, in the body of a poem, expanding and contracting. And I don't mean that just in terms of language, I mean it in terms of emotion as well. And um, that seems to me a form that is, uh, um, you know, the, the embodies it in the most clear, pure way. Um, um, I'm very drawn to the model of coming down to a kind of pinpoint uh, imagistic moment. Um, I don't know why that is. That's probably all I can say about that. Um, I haven't ever actually written a proper hypoon. Um, I need to. I just in the last days I, I, I bought from a book dealer, this prose of departures. It was James Merrill's Hypoon. I don't know if you know this poem, where he goes to Japan. He's just found out that he's HIV positive, and he goes to Japan and he, he's spreading about numerous things, and at the same time experiencing Japan for the first time. And um, so I've just been reading his Hypoon, and um, you know, it's 25, 30 years old, but it's very interesting. 
Um, Carla Sarrett has another question. She says, does the, does the fact that you're bilingual affect your writing in English? Well, I'm not really bilingual. Um, I speak French like, a, I don't know, like a smart eight-year-old, um, you could say. <laughs> um, uh, but I did grow up with other languages around me. Uh, my grandmother only spoke Armenian and my mother spoke Armenian with her and then my mother only spoke French with her family. So, um, but we weren't raised. My mother really wanted us to be American children and my parents didn't have college educations and, you know, we weren't raised with this, you know, uh, sort of forward think well, thinking bilingual uh, my parents wanted me to be an American boy, you know, so all the French I know I've learned on my own. Um, and, and yet I feel so imprinted by French, I have to say in particular French culture and well, French poetry too. I mean, um, I think when you know another language, and you all and you think of another kind of mirror word for it when you're writing it is a great gift to an artist to a writer to to have that knowledge um it presents more opportunities for you it's like another tool so i can't you know i can't say enough what it, how important it is i think uh the little bit of french i have is and it's a it's a great exercise. I do translate as an exercise, though I'm not good at it at all. Um, it's a it's hard work. I think translation is, you know, kind of God's work. It's heroic work, um, and much undervalued. You know, under rewarded. Um, who who have you tried to translate, Audrey? Well, I try and do Claire. Uh, Claire and I have done um, some different French poets together, uh, um, not really successfully. She's so uh, she's pretty tough, you know. I have to say, um, um, but with her help, I can do it. Uh, but I've never published any of them. I mean, I published a couple of Claire's, but that's all. Um, I have more confidence of them because they're her poem and I can go over it with her and I know her English is impeccable so I can go over it with her. But I don't feel confident with um, this other work. But nevertheless, I do it. I often do it every morning when I'm in France. Um, I have a question from Chelsea Hopper. Henry, Henri, would you be able to talk about promoting your book that was conceived of and created in a separate paradigm from the COVID-directed one we exist in now? Oh. And as a side question, do you happen to collect shells? And if so, how many do you have? <laughs> I do collect shells. I would show you my collection, but I don't want to stand up because you'd see what I'm wearing. <laughs> so, so I told, so I do have a shell on my shelf here. I do have this on my kitchen shelf. I do have this very beautiful conch, conch shell here. Um, but I have a I have a tray of them in the living room, but I won't bring them in to show them to you. Yeah, shells represent to me the single voice, the single voice of poetry, really. Um, I want my poems to seem like they're speaking to someone um, someone listening alone. Um, I want them to seem like a single voice speaking. Do the shells ever give you poems? I don't think I have any shells in my poems. Maybe I should. I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, I don't think I have any. You know, I didn't. I thought the book would get canceled. 
the, you know, with the confinement and as the summer went on and I thought my publication date was September 1st, I half expected for the publisher to fold. <laughs> you know, I actually half expect that still. You know, I mean, I just think because everything is changing so fast, um, I don't know what to expect. I don't know, if, you know, people, uh, the Harvard bookstore has to opened up. People are going in and buying books there uh, one at a time. But I mean, I just don't know what to expect. Um, I never expected to be doing this, not in the farthest stretch of my imagination. And yet I'm deeply grateful that I can be able to do this. Um, you know, and... Yeah. Um, I, I thought, like you, Henri, that um, books were just going to implode during this uh, quarantine and pandemic. And I find quite the opposite, that poetry yes. books are really, it's what people need. And yes. they are supporting their local bookstores, they're supporting their independent publishers, and um, I see more poetry books being read than any other kinds of books. Yes, well, I think, you know, I think there's a side of poetry that is like food, you know, it nurtures us and in confinement, we need, you know, we need special food. <laughs> I don't know. I feel, and um, um, poetry in a way is the perfect, you know, it's the perfect solution to confinement. Um, I'm not a big TV watcher. I, I watch almost no TV. Um, if I turn it on, it's usually for 30 minutes or to watch a movie, a DVD. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not plugged into the world a lot that way. So uh, reading is, um, I'm grateful for it. Um, Okay, we have a question from Patrick Davis. You spoke earlier of the attraction to fractures, gaps, and leaps. It seems to me simile helps encourage and achieve that more than metaphor might. Do you see it this way? And did that idea of a simile perhaps encouraging a big leap inform the title? Well, I think simile is important. Um, I think simile really original simile can reveal the greatness of your imagination. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think, I think that's one of, in Aristotle's poetic simile is one of the things he names, as I recall. Um, but I, but that's kind of for just for the last 20 or 30 years, I didn't really, some people are annoyed by my similes or some people are annoyed by similes, something being like something. One of my teachers was Derek Walcott in graduate school. And Walcott, I mean, he has amazing similes. My God, I learned a lot from his similes. Um, I mean, very often they're describing the ocean, but nevertheless, um, um, he is really great if, if similes are a measure of greatness, um, in my view. Well, it looks to me like we don't really have any questions left. We have some comments. Um, Weston M. says, y'all are correct on pronunciation. Hi, Hi Boone, in the sense of an English sentence. Hi, my name is Boone. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. Hey, I was thinking maybe it was Hey Boone or something. Um, Weston is one of my students. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad if there are students on. I see some students' names. I see people, you know, the amazing thing about this is that I see people from all across my life on the screen, their names, and that's very moving. It's, it's one of the, the um, pleasant side uh, effects of this pandemic is that suddenly, you know, it used to be that we would go and do a poetry reading in a small place and whoever showed up showed up and yes. now you don't have to be in real time you can 
watch the recording or you can, I, I've attended readings that are in London, in um, Georgia, in, you know, all of these far flung places that I would never get to attend otherwise. Yeah, it would be nice though to go out for, a, you know, a supper. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have, I have one more question, and it's kind of a request. It's from oh. Richard Simon. I love the poems in this book. I wonder if you might read the 10 couplet poem, Departure. How did it feel to shift out of the form of the other poems to this one? Um, do we have time? Um, I think we have about, we're, we're, we're supposed to be closing this at 7.10. Would you have, it, it, would you have time to read that poem? Sure, sure. That that poem ends on a good note to end the reading on. I just have to, that's a, you know, in my regular life, I'm on a plane a lot, uh, kind of going from Boston to Southern California, both places I love so much. And this is an airport, a sort of an airport runway poem. Um, uh, many of my poems focus on a creature or the, something in nature that leads me to something, um, something about human nature, as in the case here. Departure. During the minutes when a truck sprays frost off the small plane's wings, two deer graze beyond the tarmac barrier, their limbs flexible, their rib cages pumping air. The buck's head is adorned with a forest that renews itself each year. We came down from the mountain for a ramble, the doe announces, wearing an ice frock, sniffing his coarse hair, the bottoms of their hooves listening to the frozen landscape. She seems to be only partially certain he cares for her as she cares for him. Turning their elegance toward the runway, they face me as I face them. Then the plane taxis onward and mounts gray, bulbous clouds in a slow dissolve. Opening a newspaper, I can feel the altitude against my face but something deeper. What was that back there? Time is short. If tenderness approaches, run to it. It's a marvelous closing line. Um, and so, Peter, could you uh, unmute yourself and maybe say a few words? Thank you, Pam. Uh, that was an excellent poem, I think, to close the evening. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of a Mechanics Institute Library event. And I, I think, you know, Pam, what you and Laura have done, um, it's such a delight to work with you. Uh, we've collaborated on some wonderful, wonderful events together in the past. And, and Mechanics Institute is such an important resource and, and cultural hub. And for those of you who are like visiting, if you're in the area, please do support them. Um, get a membership. Uh, you know, we've got, as was mentioned earlier by Doug, uh, Ziziva, Lit Quaker in the building. I mean, it's a, it's a really important center. So we appreciate being asked back, uh, especially to celebrate the work of two poets we know and love. And of course, there, there are no strangers to City Lights. We featured Doug at the store many times. Uh, Henri Cole's work we greatly respect and we've been happy to be part of uh, actually Henry's last event here in San Francisco, which was incidentally also at the Mechanics Institute. So I'd like to remind you all, um, books by both authors are available via the link that Pam has posted in the chat function. It will take you to the City Lights poetry page. Uh, if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, we have titles by both Doug and Henry. Uh, of course, you may also purchase the books directly from the store. I'm happy to announce that City Lights has finally reopened its doors to the public. Of course, following San Francisco Health Department guidelines, we are ready to do business once again, so please do come and visit us. Uh, you'll be able to safely browse our stacks. Our business hours are going to be seven days a week from, eight, um, from 12 noon until 8 p.m. So we've worked very hard to transform the store for the age of COVID. The entrance is now actually on the Broadway side of the building at 271 Columbus. The original entrance is now an exit only. So uh, 
of course, we encourage you all to please wear facial covering while visiting. We're making our efforts to keep everything safe. So uh, as many of you know, City Lights is also a publishing house as well as a bookstore. We continue to publish in the grand tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti's Seminal Pocket Poets series to learn more about our books. Uh, and um, also the, just the books that we carry on our shelves and our events calendar, visit us at www.citylights.com. Um, Pam, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Henri Cole, Doug Powell, uh, everyone at Mechanics Institute, and of course you, the members of the audience. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. Please be safe, be well, and take care. Okay, I'm gonna close the doors in just a minute. If everyone wants to unmute and just say goodbye, <laughs> say, say words. Bye, bye. 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 I had so much fun. fun. Bye, Richard. Jockey says bye. goodbye. I had bye. so much yeah. fun. Bye. Hello, my beautiful cat. Bye bye. Oh, bye. Oh, bye. 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 Good night. Good night. Okay, I'm going to have to close the doors. All right. You don't have to go home, but you thank can't you, stay thank here. You. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Thanks Bye. for reading the poem on me. You're welcome, Richard. Take